Hi, everyone. As you enter the room, so glad that you could be here. This is Allison here from NREL. Um, you are all very prompt. We're going to give it just a minute or two uh, before we get going with this webinar. So just hang tight for, yeah. for just a minute. I guess I'm still stuck on where the money comes from. Okay, everybody. Let's see how many people do we have in the room. I can't even see Julia. How many people are, do we have on here? Uh, Twenty two people. Twenty two people. Okay. Well, I think we'll go ahead and just start the talking. I know a few more people may trickle in, um, but we'll go ahead and get going. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. So as I said before, my name is Allison. I work at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, um, one of so many acronyms you'll hear uh, over the course of the next hour. But um, we're here today to talk about ways that weatherization assistance program agencies can partner and engage with high schools, community colleges, vocational school programs as a way to help ramp up and build their potential workforce pipeline. So just about everybody that's on this call today um, was connected to us through uh, a weatherization technical assistance offering. So NREL is sort of the coordinator here, but we've got people on the line that I'll introduce in just a second from um, a number of organizations, IREC, NASCASP, NCAP, um, a lot of people who are supporting the workforce needs of the weatherization assistance program. And so this is sort of a collaborative effort here, one of the one of the um, ways that we're trying to offer some support to you. The plan for today is uh, I'm going to start with just a quick introduction again of why we're here and what we're what planning to talk about setting the stage a little bit. I'll talk about at a high level the different ways um, that you all can engage with high schools and give some examples from the weatherization assistance program of the network of people who have done this and found success in it. Then I'm going to hand it over to um, my colleague Brent, uh, who is going to talk about uh, sort of best practices to engage with students. So not just, you know, you can give a presentation, but when you're giving that presentation, how can you be most effective in, in connecting? Um, and then we'll end with some of the resources that are available now or are coming soon in this area. And we will leave time for questions at the end. I will say, as we're going through the slides, if you have a like a clarifying question on something that was presented, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll be uh, monitoring that. And if it feels like an important um, something that, you know, to, to answer in the moment um, that may be helpful for everybody, we'll do that. Otherwise, we'll go to that chat and, and you can either use the chat function or raise your hand or come off mute, whatever that looks like at the end. Um, just quickly, the people that you're going to hear from today. So I already introduced myself, Allison Moe from NREL. Um, everyone else is going to introduce themselves as they speak, but we've got Brent Kosick from Service Year Alliance. We've got Pagan Pajoni from IREC, um, Kai Garvin from NASCASP, and then Julia uh, Madeira's coad from NREL. And I will say Julia is our like tech guru for this uh, Zoom webinar. So if you're having any technical difficulties, you can maybe find her in the chat and send her a direct message or something like that. And she can do her best to, to help you with whatever issues that you are having. Um, but I think with that, we're going to go ahead and just start moving forward. Oh, the last thing I will say, we are recording today's webinar, um, and this will be made available to you all if you want to share it with um, colleagues or other agencies that you work with or something like that. Um, and we'll share the slides as well. Um, we'll sort of share it as a package and I'll email everybody, hopefully like in the next week or so once we get that posted. Um, so I'm just going to I'm going to frame sort of the why we're here and this is not meant to be new news to anybody on this call you're all here because you're having some sort of workforce related challenge with your agency but um, I, I want you to know really what this slide is showing is that 
even though the challenge that you might be facing, there's going to be elements of it that are unique to your agency, to your location, things about your local economy, what that might look like. It, it is not just you. This is a, a WAP weatherization-wide challenge. It's an energy efficiency industry challenge. It's a construction industry. It's an economy-wide challenge. So you're not alone in this. Um, I have some facts here to back it up. I'm a national lab. I have to back up whatever I say with some sort of citation. But NREL did a survey of subgrantees last year right and and just to meet sort of like the influx of funds and the work associated that for for bipartisan infrastructure law uh funding there could be a, a need for as many as 4000 new positions across the weatherization network over the next few years um in a report the U.S. Energy and Employment Report, which DOE puts out every year and updates, you know, 92% of energy efficiency employers, so not just weatherization, but across the board, um, reported difficulty in finding qualified workers. And then in a, in a national survey published in 2022 of residential construction sites, you know, a quarter of workers were thinking of le leaving their job. So these are just things to, to help you uh, maybe feel a little bit better that you're not alone in this challenge. Um, but but there's there's a lot of opportunities and through this workforce development TA, we're trying to touch on a lot of them. Um, specific to this particular presentation, um, the op there's this opportunity area with engaging high schools and community colleges and tech programs. So, you know, the weatherization assistance program for its field staff does not require college education, right? We have our own training centers and, and funding to provide that training. Um, and just know that there are a lot of programs and a lot of students that are doing related training out there in the world. So um, the latest data available on high school uh, CTE, career and technical education programs, right? 200 and something thousand students are participating in construction related programs across the US. And there are more than 400 construction or carpentry programs and more than 500 HVAC tech programs at community colleges and trade schools across the U.S. So this, there's an opportunity if you're not already engaging with these type of audiences in these types of institutions, right? Obviously, there, there, there is a lot out there, and they could be an untapped resource for for you all in your workforce recruitment efforts. So some quick, quick definitions of things that we're all going to talk about. Um, so CTE, career and technical education. So this is um, career focused programming that's offered at middle schools high schools, community colleges, most of it is at the high school level, um, but it's a combination of acad academic instruction and skills instruction. So it's sort of what used to be like shop class at high schools and it's evolved. There's a bunch of different career areas that it goes into, but architecture and construction is one of them. Um, you have your community colleges, which are post-secondary or after high school um, schools that offer certificates in two-year degrees um, that you can either be standalone or feed into four-year programs. Technical colleges uh, are like community colleges, but they are more career focused. Community colleges tend to have some general education requirements associated with their degree programs that often technical colleges don't have. And then you have specialty trade or vocational schools um, that are really like industry skill specific training. Um, they're often privately funded, though not always, um, and they're often aligned with sort of local trade organizations. So just lots of words, but so to make sure you understand the words that we're talking about when we when we go through this. Um, so the, the, the next thing I'm going to talk about is just this spectrum of different ways you can engage with schools. So I'm going to stay on this slide for a while and talk through it. But, um, you know, I'm actually going to do this. So there are a lot of ways you can engage. I'll talk through these. Your level of engagement really depends first and foremost on your availability. So I may describe some things that sound awesome, but require a lot of time. <laughs> um, and if you don't have a lot of time, like don't think that that is what you need to do to be effective, right? Do what is gonna work with your availability, with your staffing levels, all of that stuff. Um, to make it, that'll make it most effective, right? Because it's using your time most effectively. The other thing is it's going to depend on what the schools offer, right? So if you're in a region that doesn't have a lot of these school programs, that'll limit what you're able to do. Uh, and then third, it's really going to depend on instructor interest. So sometimes you may connect with somebody at a school 
who is just all about weatherization. They love this idea of building science. They want to integrate it. And it makes it really, it can make your, your job really easy to do, to, to make those connections. Other times you're not gonna find those local champions and that's okay, right? Work with the, what they have. But going back to these different ways you can get involved and, and Brent's gonna talk a little bit more about some of these. Um, so I, I won't go too far, but again, it can, it can, it can look like a lot of things. So the easiest way that you could get involved is just posting your jobs, right? So less at high schools, but definitely at community colleges and tech schools, they probably have some sort of job board. It might be a physical board. Um, it's probably a, a virtual job board, right? Where they have local job listings rel related to the programs that they have. So if you're not already posting at these local schools, you know, especially if they have programs related to weatherization skills, that is a great opportunity um, to just make sure additional people who are oh. already interested in this field sounds so dangerous. why can i hear um so uh, that you're already connecting to these people um and getting your jobs uh in front of them the sort of next step up from there in terms of effort on your end it could be attending events that these schools are already hosting right so often high schools community colleges they'll have career events um throughout the year right and so you can just sign up and you can have a booth and you can have a table and you can talk about your agency at that event and you have sort of a captive audience there. Next step up, right, is um, is doing a presentation in a, in the classroom. So this involves you reaching out and finding an, an instructor um, at a specific school and scheduling a time, you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever time they have available, and you going into that classroom and talking about um, careers and weatherization opportunities. And we have some resources that can help you with that that we're going to talk about at the end of this presentation. Um, next step up, right, you can do you can offer um, um, for students to actually come and, and visit you to do field trips to some of your job sites or to your warehouse or whatever. They can do job shadowing, um, you know, with your with your staff to see it kind of happen in in real life. Um, another opportunity beyond that is is to get involved with the school beyond just a high school, just a presentation in a classroom, but you could actually get involved with um, shaping the curriculum that is being taught. So we have examples of this in the weatherization network. Um, and I, I have a, in the next slide, you'll see we have a new sort of database of success stories um, and solutions that I can share. But, you know, there are examples of, you know, agencies started doing a once a semester presentation and started to build a rapport with those instructors. And then the instructor said, hey, you're talking about building science, right? There's no building science content in my construction program. There's no building science content in my HVAC program, which is pretty common. <laughs> um, that's a pretty common thing out there, right? Like, how would you be interested in helping me figure out the best way to incorporate some of that into what I'm offering my students, right? And that has happened. And then, and then you're shaping and making sure that you're sort of like building that pipeline at a much broader scale. It's not just about bringing those students to apply to your jobs, but about helping build just the building science knowledge in the industry in your region. Um, and then you can offer internships, right? So that's a next step up there. And there are also examples of this throughout the weatherization network of offering, you know, a, a summer three month position or offering a, you know, something smaller, you know, whatever that looks like, whatever works for your agency, but for students that are that are interested, um, you can work to create these internship opportunities. And then the final example would be if you wanted to create an entire workforce program from scratch that that was in coordination with a school and that built a pipeline directly from that school into your program. And that requires the highest level of engagement. There are absolutely examples of this in the weatherization assistance program. So um, some of you may have heard about this, but in Chicago, um, CETA worked with a number of different partners that the local agency is in, in Chicago worked with a number of different partners, including high schools to create, um, to create a sort of building science, more on the HVAC side, a uh, certification program that started when students, I think, are in 10th grade, but it follows them through and they do, um, say, have some some like actual internship time, paid internship time, they're getting classroom training, um, a variety of things, right? And they're sort of like crafting these students to meet them in there. Um, when they graduate, they are they are ready and prepared to be a weatherization, um, you know, tech. Uh, there are other options working with community colleges, right, of having partnerships directly into there. So you you help build a program at the school that gets people directly prepared to do what it is you want to do. So. Um, any of those 
are, can can result in people and people learning about your agency, applying to your jobs. One isn't better than the other. Again, it's going to just depend on your availability, what the school has available, and sort of how much the instructor or the other person at the whoever it is you're engaging with at that school, how much how much interest and time they are willing to put in to help build these partnerships together. Um, uh, so I wanted to sort of explain all of those options there. But, um, I will say, if you are curious to learn more, I know I, I sort of generally said there are examples of this in the network. I don't want to take too much time just on me. In a, in a second, I'll drop these um, links into the into the chat. But um, we have a new, something called the, the Weatherization Successes and Solutions Center. This was just um, put made live earlier this week. But we're trying to capture some of these best practices and these case studies in a lot of areas, including workforce, in one place. Um, and so we have a number of solutions and workforce stories, including some of these school engagement stories on that web page. And you can just easily go through them. They're very short. They're a couple paragraphs long. So um, understand. And then there is a, a tool that uh, was created last year that may sort of get phased out, but a workforce development toolkit um, for weatherization that has a few other success stories that will get merged to this other one in time. But um, I'll, I'll put those in the chat. And if you want to just read about how other agencies are handling this, those are some good opportunities. Um, okay, with that, I don't think there are any pressing questions in the chat. So I'm going to hand it over to Brent, who's going to deep dive into some of the examples I was giving and how to be most effective in doing those types of engagement. Well, thanks, Allison, and thanks, everybody, for having me. Uh, I'm kind of excited about checking out that new resource you shared, Allison. So thanks for helping put that together. Uh, just quickly to introduce myself, I'm Brent Kosick. I'm Director of Programs at Service Here Alliance. Uh, what our organization generally does is we support a network of national service programs across the country. So thinking about programs like AmeriCorps, VISTA, Youth Build, Peace Corps, things like that that you might have had some interactions with before. Um, but a big part of my role at the organization is to work with the programs that are advancing climate and environmental resilience needs and how we can better connect them as a workforce development um, talent pipeline to um, energy efficiency programming, weatherization, clean energy, and these kind of growing green economy. Uh, so that's where I've kind of been connected with um, NREL on a few different fronts for infusing capacity into the weatherization network and also work with some of the other partners on this call as well with uh, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, um, their WAP uh, Innovation and Enhancement Projects, and also their ACE Network pro project about apprenticeships and clean energy. Um, so with that, um, Allison, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. So just like Allison said, what I'll really be doing for the next few minutes is kind of building on some of those strategies that Allison pointed out in that great slide she put together earlier. I want to just echo her same comments. Um, you know, in our industry, we faced very similar challenges about, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, you used to be able to do that kind of post and pray method or just sticking a job on Indeed and you're going to find those applicants. But we're not in that job market anymore where, um, you know, first of all, we're all competing for um, the same talent. And then also uh, young people today really want to make sure that they are buying into a career or an employer that they really feel comfortable about too. So it's all about um, kind of thinking about outside of the box about what you did in the past and maybe how you can kind of build on your recruitment strategies going forward. Uh, you'll kind of see throughout my slides today that a big Part of that is relationship building and relationship development is a big piece of that. And doing that the right way is like, that's the type of thing that is going to help you set you up for success in the future. Those are the type of folks that will provide you applicants going forward. They'll provide you with opportunities moving forward as they arise in the future. So kind of building those relationships are a big theme you'll see here today. But the three main topics that we'll be discussing is uh, strategies for engaging post-secondary institutions. Then we'll kind of dig into a few additional best practices for specifically engaging high schools. And then um, giving you a few like tips and trips, tips for making sure that your um, outreach strategies with these different um, kind of talent pipelines can be as effective as possible. So with that, next, Allison. So first of all, talking about post-secondary institutions, um, just like Allison said, like, Primarily, your, your entry point at universities, tech schools, um, vocational schools is going to be what is generally called the Campus Career Center. Uh, this is kind of a base of operations for 
navigating the full kind of recruitment environment of a university or community college or tech school. Um, they can be helpful in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, things like, first of all, of course, they can be a hub for like placing like any kind of flyers or any kind of brochures that you want to go and place at the, the uh, school as far as print materials. But they're also going to be the ones that can give you those names to talk through throughout the, the institution as well. Like what are the professors, faculty, staff, admin that you should potentially be connecting with to provide some additional opportunities for presentations or to connect as, as far as uh, even building just relationships for recommending students and things like that. Um, I guess another great thing about the campus career centers is that they're also going to tell you, give you like the best practices for their campus as well, too. So they're going to know, you know, specifically can point you to the job boards that their university or campus uses. Sometimes that's specific for the uh, campus where it's maybe, a, you know, a institution specific job board. Some of them use like kind of national job boards like Purple Briefcase. Um, uh, handshake, things like that, and they'll be able to help you kind of navigate the maybe the various systems that they use. Um, something also worth asking if you're like a community action agency or like a nonprofit or uh, affiliated with a government institution as well is oftentimes they can offer like discounts for posting jobs for like a nonprofit or government entity as well. So just kind of some of those tips and tricks can be helpful in just having those initial interactions with an institution. Next up. Um, so one of my best pieces of advice about where you go into not only the campus career centers, but just kind of as you're building relationships across the board is come into those conversations with thinking about the value add that you can also bring to that institution or for the individual that you're interacting with. Um, so for example, like if you just come in and just kind of ask some questions and, and uh, pass off some brochures, you got to think that there's probably plenty of other employers that are doing the very same thing. And so in order to increase your effectiveness, also coming there with some ideas of, of how you would maybe be able to further those relationships. Things like offering to, uh, oftentimes the, um, institutions offer like kind of like career pe prep days for their students where like mock interviews and things like that. Offering to volunteer for those kind of things. Um, if they have certain kind of like employer advisory councils or other volunteer opportunities for employers, you know, be asking those type of questions. And then you're the type of employer that they're going to be sending their students to because there's a kind of that mutually beneficial relationship. Next, please. So as you're thinking about what post-secondary institutions to, to outreach to is I kind of usually recommend building relationships with kind of targeting like at least three different campuses or institutions. Of course, like Allison mentioned, you'll want to probably cam uh, target the ones that are, of course, in your region or not, uh, close to your project sites, offer kind of courses or, or certifications that align with um, the weatherization industry. But in addition to that, you know, I think something that's very worth asking is where your current employees are coming from or the employees in your sector so that you can kind of see what the trends are as far as where folks are already have showed interest and the kind of students that are generating weatherization employees in, in your state, city, region, whatever it might be. Also, if you really are you're strategic about your what campuses you def decide to engage or build relationships with, you can also make a lot of progress on diversifying your workforce as well. So I know that Allison put together some really great resources that she's going to share at the end of today's presentation. But I also linked out a few additional websites that can help you identify like um, institutions that uh, serve a high percentage of minority populations or women populations or indigenous populations were some areas that you might wanna grow your workforce in. Um, so, okay, beyond the career center, you also wanna think about what are all the other opportunities to start building those like on the ground kind of relationships. So thinking kind of additional opportunities to kind of get on your radar is there's, Oftentimes a lot of addition, additional campus events that take place usually at the beginning of like each semester. So everything from like clubs to like uh, professional associations that, you know, there might be student recruiters or faculty or staff recruiters as part of these events. But even just kind of walking around those type of opportunities, talking to the different booths that are set up there to like meet faculty, staff, talk about kind of what you're interested in and then seeing whether or not you can plug into their group, club, whatever it might be for a small presentation or for them to at least offer your um, position postings to like their membership listservs and things like that. 
You can also, again, ask your current employees to introduce you to um, you know, college professors, faculty, staff that they already have a relationship with, or students that they already know at maybe the community colleges that they recently graduated from. That's a great way of just having that already like introduction type of relationship going. I guess bottom line, how I would summarize this is that, you know, typically just sending out like bulk emails to like professors or uh, trainers or facilitators uh, isn't always the most effective way. So having some actual presence on campus can be really helpful. You know, finding um, office hours or office opportunities to just go introduce yourself to uh, faculty and staff can be really effective. Um, everybody likes free stuff. So even when you send out an email, just offer to, you know, buy a cup of coffee for a um, teacher or professor that's willing to meet with you for 30 minutes just to kind of talk about all the different opportunities it might be to present to their students or partner with their university can be helpful as well. Next, please. Um, so a few additional tips and tricks is, you know, I think a lot of times um, we are starting to uh, write off kind of like those print opportunities for advertising positions. But at least what we find in our industry is that students still most definitely read kind of campus newspapers and publications. Oftentimes there's downtime between classes or maybe while they're looking at lunch, they'll grab kind of like a college publication that's readily available to them. So our industry does find success with posting uh, positions within those kind of like campus-based uh, uh, newsletters. So I would not write those off. Oftentimes they're very affordable to, to post it as well. So something that just makes sure that's kind of in your arsenal of outreach. Um, as far as, again, as you're making like on the ground kind of connections on campuses, always kind of have some kind of print material that you can also distribute throughout the campus. Some interesting areas or some effective areas to do that is anywhere that students like eat, play, or study. So if there's like a student activity center or gym on campus, oftentimes there'll be some kind of board outside of those that you can post to. Um, you know, of course, like libraries or study hall type of things. And then, you know, of course, like the career fair and things like that, but also like lunch halls and anywhere that like students have some downtime can be really effective. So don't just limit it just to the career center is what I'm saying. Um, something else that our industry has found to be effective is, is that we see an uptick in applications during like the holiday break periods. So you want to make sure that you have your postings kind of advertised on whatever job boards that those universities or uh, colleges or tech schools are using going into the holidays, because that's when you're going to see more students actually spending time on what is their next career move. Um, so, you know, might be a little bit late right now, but like now would be a key time to make sure that your postings are active. Next, please. Um, Okay, so we're just sifting a little bit to engaging high schools. I would say just about everything I just said about post-secondary institutions is also uh, going to be effective for high schools. But just a few additional kind of pointers here is um, your key point of entry for most high schools is going to be like counselors. Um, but oftentimes, like counselors can be very busy as well. And if you're having trouble like interacting with counselors or even like locating those staff, um, you know, again, stopping by a um, high school to introduce yourself to administrative staff at front desk and like, get their advice on who they sh you should be talking to or what groups or networks you should be involved in, uh, that can be just as effective. Um, and oftentimes, again, like as long as you're just like not wanting to walk around the school and stuff and just kind of introduce yourself and asking for advice about like career opportunities, that's usually acceptable for, um, you know, introducing yourself to high schools. Um, again, you can use your current employees to make introductions at their former high schools with teachers, faculty, staff. So don't um, kind of forget about your current employees as a resource to you. I'm not sure how applicable this would be to everyone's positions, but if you are offering part-time positions, we found a lot of effectiveness with advertising through parent-teacher organizations like PTO uh, listservs and network groups. Could we find that there's a lot of parents that are looking for part-time opportunities while their kids are actually in school. And so that has been one of like the most effective things for working with high school for us is like just getting on the radar of PTO groups where you attend a meeting and kind of announce the opportunity or send it out through their like listservs and emails, things like that. Next, please. All right, so we're gonna be moving into like increasing your effectiveness of your outreach. One thing that I do wanna suggest is that 
first of all, just like Allison mentioned, career fairs should most definitely be part of your recruitment strategy. And oftentimes they can produce some great candidates. But generally throughout my work is what I've found is oftentimes I, I, I've received feedback that career fairs haven't been worth like the time and money investment uh, because they can be expensive and time consuming. And so what we found is that oftentimes what we, we kind of classify as captive audience events have been some of the most effective opportunities um, to return a, a return on your investment of time and money. So what I mean by a captive audience event is generally like any time that you have a few minutes in front of like an engaged audience rather than like a career fair where you just have a booth and you're hoping for people that come by. Um, so, you know, you can do things like, again, like produce, uh, present to classrooms and things like that, like we've been talking about, but also think outside the box a little bit. So, you know, oftentimes campuses offer like, you know, students might be participating in certain service days throughout the uh, year, or there might be like career development kind of uh, opportunities or activities that the um, uh, campus is offering as far as like speaking events or panel discussions or lunch and learns. Those are the type of things that you're going to have an audience that's actually there to listen to what you have to say and can, again, produce a higher level of uh, engagement and ultimately applications. Also, like, you know, things like, like, let's say you do go to a campus and they're having a volunteer day on Martin Luther King Day of Service, right? You can offer simple things like, well, if I sponsor, like, you know, a breakfast snack, let's say I bring 100 bananas, can I have three minutes to talk about the great work my organization is doing in the community and opportunities we have? For your students to consider. Um, that can be an investment of 30 bucks that, again, you might be able to speak to like 50 students right off the bat on some Saturday day of service. So that's a really uh, efficient use of $30. Uh, so be thinking kind of outside of the box and, and you can, again, use career fairs or relationships with faculty and staff to identify different opportunities like that. Next up, please. Um, so I think we can skip to probably the next slide as well. So now we're just kind of talking about um, participating in career fairs, which again, it can be an effective strategy. So don't write that off. Just a few suggestions I have here is that, you know, oftentimes I'll see organizations that invest, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars to attend a career fair, um, but then not invest the same kind of money into like a career booth. And you got to be thinking that this is the first impression or individuals have of your organization. So if you are going to invest in career fairs, make sure that your booth is also kind of reflecting that investment to make sure that, you know, you are doing things like, you know, first of all, having like nice like table runners or even like banners and things like that. But like simple things you can do for like low cost is even put together like pictures from your organization, like highlighting that kind of a day of in the job. And just put that on a loop in a PowerPoint slide and bring your laptop and put it on like anything that's going to engage like with pictures or slideshows and things like that can help draw people to your booth. Um, of course, like spend a few dollars for some swag, like candy is always like the easiest thing to get people over, but people like anything like sticky notepads, anything like that can be a low cost to make sure that people are actually coming to your booth. Especially if you might be competing with other employers that might be even like offering starting salaries that might, could be double of, of what your entry level positions are, things like that. Next up, please. Um, so another piece of advice I have for career fairs is that oftentimes I think we are apt to like, when someone comes to our booth, we want to just like talk about all the great things about our program, make sure they're aware of weatherization and the work that, that we do. Um, and then also oftentimes we speak to the things that we enjoy about the position or we enjoy about the job, but that's not really the right way to approach folks as they come to your booth. It you really should be starting with asking them questions because just like you know, recruitment is very much like selling a product. You want to know what their interest is so you can speak specifically to that interest. So as someone comes to your booth, kind of refrain back from just kind of spitting out your pitch and instead say, hey, you know, tell me about what major you're in. What, what are you thinking about as next step career? What are you interested? What's important to you? So then that way you can find out, well, this person's really interested in not having a desk job. So let me talk about those aspects. Or they're really interested in, you know, healthcare benefits. Let me talk about that or they, they want a staff or, or a, um, a desk job. Let me talk about the opportunities we have in that world so that you can kind of streamline your conversation to really pull people in rather than the, telling them the things that may be interested to you, but might not be interested to the person that's buying the positions you have op open. 
Next, please. Um, some other just things before you get into a career fair is like you should kind of you know partner up with someone to rehearse some um, objections that could come up as you're speaking to audiences and and think about what your potential kind of answers would be to that. Um, so it's really helpful, like you know, if someone has uh, reservations about um, you know working out in the field, you can talk about the opportunities you have um, as administrative type of positions. Or if they're concerned about the salary you have to offer, talk about the other benefits or the training that you provide for upward movement or where the career path can take them in the future. That kind of stuff can really help you, again, increase your effectiveness. Also make sure that you kind of have a rehearsed close with folks to give them actionable steps that they can move towards, especially for folks that visit your booth that you think might be interested. Um, you can say things like, uh, you know, I encourage you to on the spot join our community action agency's um, social media page so you can stay informed about positions. Uh, we offer job shadowing opportunities if you want to come out in a day and kind of experience things. Um, this is what the application process would look like. Give me a call if you need any additional assistance. You can also think about things like, um, you know, some folks find it effective to have an opportunity to like do like a first round kind of interview with inter um, individuals who might be interested on the spot. So that's like a really good way of pulling people in quickly. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be your official interview process, but if someone is really interested, you can say, hey, you know, after this career fair, where for the next hour, we're going to sit down with interested applicants and learn a little bit more about them, tell them a little bit more about your organization and get the application started. That way you're not like losing people along the way and can be like a really effective use of time if you're already visiting the campus. Next, please. Um, these are just a few kind of like last minute kind of suggestions again about effectiveness of, of career fair. Um, you know, bringing uh, multiple staff will give you an opportunity to, if you wanted to do on the spot interviews, you can pull away from the staff, but also having like additional folks to that can add enthusiasm is always great to have at your booth. So again, bring like current employees that can tell about the day-to-day -day experience and then also maybe are from that institution that can kind of relay on that personal level. Um, let's see here. I think I went over most of these things. Um, I guess one thing again, it's like something that should be right in front of folks, but I think is oftentimes missed maybe because career fairs can be exhausting. Is like, if you're already gonna be on campus at a career fair, that should be your opportunity to also walk around campus afterwards to put those flyers at places that people play, eat, or learn, or just see who you can meet along the way to start building those relationships. I think oftentimes that's not part of someone's like plan for the day and can be like a missed opportunity. Next, please. Um, so we'll go, this was this kind of those uh, example of those next steps that you can um, offer. So as we distribute the slide deck, those will be in front of you, but I'm not gonna kind of go over those again. But I guess, um, I think hope, hopefully I didn't go over time, but I'll just kind of wrap things up there. Uh, I guess I do want to say that, you know, um, you know, at the end of this presentation, Pagan is going to be talking about Green Workforce Connect. I do want to say, like, we didn't have time today, but we also have a lot of resources through that system that can help you, like, actually, like, have social media presence, um, application presence to speak to diverse audiences as well. So that's going to be a great resource if you want to dig deeper than what we were able to cover today. But with that, I'll relinquish my time. And thank you, Allison. Thank you, Brent. Yeah. Um, the only other thing on what Brent was describing that I want to say before we do the last few minutes of this is that, you know, what he's describing takes time. So, you know, putting something on Indeed is very easy, but in this particular economy at this point in time, that may not be what is needed. I, I will say for those of you who may not have been able to make it a couple of weeks ago, Brent had a, a, a presentation with the Building Performance Association, um, but they are looking at an AmeriCorps program that would um, place AmeriCorps members with work with weatherization agencies, state and local weatherization agencies to help with some of this sort of capacity building community stakeholder engagement 
work. So if you love the idea of this, but like know that you just don't have the staffing to do it and would be interested in a in a pretty low cost to you uh, staff member that could support this, reach out to Brent to learn more about that application. It's just an application right now, but it's looking to specifically support um, the weatherization assistance program to do this sort of work, both for recruiting workers and for um, like client engagement and just partner engagement. Um, so real quick resources, these are not all of the resources, but we're going to highlight some of the main ones. So next steps for you, right? Like you want to identify what are the right schools in your region that might be a good fit for you to go visit. Use everything that Brent just described to like contract, contact and introduce yourself to the right people there. Um, again, start small, right? If you want to, if you have a vision of creating a workforce pipeline program, great, but maybe start by just introducing yourself and presenting it something. You don't have to go big necessarily right now, but based on sort of the interest and the feedback you get, you can learn about growing and, and doing new and more things as time moves on. Um, I want to reiterate to engage in the way that works for you. There's no reason for you to like extend, overextend yourself because you know, you may speak to 100 students and one may apply to a job or none might, right? Like you just never know. It depends on who the day and what time of year it is and who you're getting in front of. But engage in the way that works for you. And just remember that all of the people you're working with, especially at community college, instructors are enthusiastic, but they are so busy. You're especially your adjunct instructors. They are busy. Make whatever you are doing easy for them to help build that sort of trust and relationship early on. In terms of finding the schools and the programs, I, you're going to all get a copy of this slide deck, so I'm not going to worry too much about it now, but um, for colleges and trade schools and things, it's pretty easy. College Navigator is a great website. I've put some tips for using that website if you haven't to sort of narrow down what you're looking for. If you're looking for high school CTE programs, it's not quite as straightforward. Um, you have every state's website is different, so you got to go to the national website to find your state contact, and then you can sort of navigate from there, but there are ways to do that. I will also say for those of you involved in the um, this workforce development technical assistance offering, we are doing a little bit of this work for certain organizations where we just do the legwork of finding uh, schools in their region. So if that sounds useful to you, you can always send me an email. Allison, I'll ha we have our emails at the end. So just be aware of that. Um, and then we do have some new resources before I hand it over to Pagan to talk about the Green Workforce Connect. So we just posted this Actually, do you want to? I'm gonna. Do you want to talk about this, Kai, or do you want me to to talk about this? This is now on NASCASP's website. Where you can go ahead, Allison. I, I can pick it up after. Yeah. Okay, so we just put this up here, but if you are wanting to present in a classroom, like it, whether that's a high school classroom, community college classroom, but if you have 30 minutes or something, we've created a slide deck that you can download, you can edit, but it has an introduction to like what is weatherization. It has information about the sort of main career pathways and occupations within the weatherization assistance program. It has activities that, you know, um, you talking at students, especially like 17 year olds or something for 30 or 40 minutes, like you may not totally like engage them, but if you can get them out of their seats and, you know, show them something that they remember, that can often really help. And so we have different activities that are very easy to do with the the tools and resources you have here. Um, so, and a lot of what went into this was research done by IREC and different groups that, that Pagan's going to talk about here in a couple of minutes about how to talk about weatherization careers. So Brent was giving general best practices, but weatherization is a weird place where that term doesn't connect with a lot of people initially. And so uh, IREC has done a lot of work with NASCASP and others about how to talk about these jobs in a way that, that connect to people. And so um, that has been worked into this particular slide deck uh, and the, you know, the, the um, speaker notes and the instructions and things like that. So just be aware that that is brand new. There are also, Brent was talking about, you know, having flyers and stuff. There are editable weatherization career flyers um, that are on the same NASCASP webpage um, that you can take, you can download, you can edit, you can add your own information um, that are, if you don't have a, you know, community communications team to format things, you can just take this and add your own agency's information to make that really easy. Um, and then I know NASCASP has a lot more in the works. Kai, do you want to just take a couple minutes to talk about what else you have going on? Uh, yeah, I think um, that you'll see a lot of tools coming up on this. I would save this link. We are doing a lot more, um, not not only us, but anything that NREL is working with us on or other things will be posted on this um, link here on the NASCASP website. So 
uh, they have hired me specifically to do the weatherization workforce program management here at NASCASP. And um, we're trying to, you know, between all of us partners, we'll be having a lot of initiatives and um, resources going out along with what Pagan's about to talk about. Uh, I know we will be doing an updated wage survey, a national wage survey to try to see, you know, where we're at um, nationally on the network for weatherization wages. Uh, we're also working on some other bill BIL initiatives um, for that funding for for workforce development. So just mainly keep an eye out. Uh, definitely keep watching newsletters and all the other things to keep up with all the <laughs> numerous numerous things going on right now. So. Thank you, Kai. I'm going to hand it over to Pagan to talk a little more about Green Workforce Connect, and then we'll wrap up. Hello, everyone. My name is Pagan Pagioni, and I am a program director on the workforce development team at IREC. And we are um, the lead on a new initiative called Green Workforce Connect. We've been working since March. I noticed um, some of the participants in the call are very familiar, have either participated in listening sessions or been on webinars with us. Um, or are directly involved in the project in some way. So this is really a uh, workforce development focused project. It represents a national collaboration um, really designed to raise awareness of an interest in weatherization um, career pathways and also opportunities for contractors. And we are focused on cultivating a new generation of diverse professionals and contractors for the Weatherization Assistance Program. Um, as part of the project, we are launching a new platform. You can go to the next slide, Allison, called Green Workforce Connect. Um, you can preview it at greenworkforceconnect.org. Um, there's a number of components to this project. Um, we are piloting um, direct connections between job seekers and contractors with um, 17 subgrantees in Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, and Wisconsin. Um, so you'll see if you go to the platform and explore, um, there's different state pages, and we just have those three states right now. But of um, interest and applicability to the entire network right now is our new resource hub for organizations, which is focused on um, workforce development specific tools, templates, and supports. Um, so Brent referenced, you know, information about language and outreach. We have an outreach and engagement toolkit there that has different language for um, different populations, women, youth, veterans. Um, there are job description templates for each of the four key weatherization assistance program roles. Um, there are also links to commonly requested um, program resources. We were mentioning earlier that sometimes it's hard to find um, or get directed to the place that you're, you're looking at. I know all of us are working um, collaboratively to try and make access to information and resources more, more seamless and, and easy for the network. Um, and then um, by the end of this year, we're also um, adding a guide to contractor success designed to assist new contractors um, and new business, new contracting businesses to um, weatherization work. And we are launching all of this publicly and you can join us, um, Allison, you can go to the next slide. You can join us on January 25th to um, learn more about the project and our plans um, for workforce development supports and how the pilot program is gonna work and our, um, our plans for national rollout. Cool, thank you, Pagan. Um, so I just, the last couple slides and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, this, this particular webinar today was about high schools and community colleges and tech schools, but in terms of like the broader workforce development ecosystem, there are a whole lot of other ways that you can get the word out there about your job opportunities. Um, so there's, when you get this slide deck, there are some additional resources in appendix slides that talk about it, but that's also gonna be the focus of a, a webinar that we have coming up 
going to skip forward really quick too. So um, things that we have coming up. So this is what Pagan just described, that first bullet. But we have a, a webinar scheduled for January 30th, which I just sent out to a bunch of people um, earlier this week. But it's just about best practices in general for recruitment and onboarding. So we're going to have some sort of general best practices tailored to weatherization. We're going to have Pagan back to talk in more detail about some of the template job descriptions and things available on Workforce Connect because it will be publicly available by then and uh, and out there. Um, but just understand like this is one little section of it, but there are a whole lot of other partners you can engage with in your communities to help get the word out there about your um, about your jobs. And then we do have one more webinar scheduled for late February that's more on the retention succession planning piece. Um, so just keep it on there. If you don't know about it, it's, it's here now. Um, but I want to, because we only have 10 minutes left, are there, do people have questions? We threw a whole lot of information, a whole lot of links. Everybody was great about trying to get as many links in the chat as possible. And like I said, we'll follow up with these slides so that you have um, them as well. But I would just like to open it up if anyone wants to raise their hand or put something in the chat or just come off mute. I'm going to let the awkward silence sit for a second just to make sure everyone has if they're typing. Hi, Allison. Andrea Olson from Community Action Partnership in North Dakota. Um, I don't know. I haven't really thought out my plan or my question. <laughs> so bear with me. But do you have like these are all such incredible resources. So thank you. This my mind is racing after hearing this conversation today. Um, do you have some examples? Are there community action agencies that have had luck with this resource or that resource? Um, can you speak to, I, it's such a loaded question. I, I understand that. Um, I can give a response, but some of the other people on the call may also be able to. So a lot of like the resources, like the new slide deck, like a lot of these things are brand new. So I don't know that we, Pagan may have examples of people that have piloted them, um, but I do some of those case studies. So I sh there's a link and this is the hard part where I'm sharing my slides. So it's hard for me to like get to the other things, but this new success stories, weatherization success stories page that I referenced early on has about 10 workforce stories right now from across the network. Um, and it includes some of these. So um, like there's an organization and I just don't want to like, I, I've spoken with so many people, uh, recently that I don't want to name the wrong organization. Um, but absolutely. So I, there are examples there. Are, I have, I have spoken with people at agencies who have said we did this and, and we've, you know, either gotten like people who spend their summer working with us or, um, who have like you again, been gotten to the place where they do regular presentations at like their local tech school. Then they got invited to, to join the, like their, uh, advisory council for that whole HVAC program. And they part of that to inform that curriculum and get more building science content in there. Um, there are examples of people creating those pipeline partnerships. So um, start with what's on that success stories page, and it might have just gotten shared one more time in the chat. Um, so start there and just they're easy to read. There's like 10 of them, but they're like two paragraphs. So you could easily flip through them and see not all of them are up there yet. <laughs> so if there are specific examples of this that you don't see on that page yet, because I haven't gotten them up there, you can email. I'm going to share all of our emails here in a second. But like, email me and I can connect you with whoever I've had a conversation on. And then I don't know if Kai or Pagan have other examples to share. I I can share a mini example. I mean, I know um, not necessarily these resources exactly, but the same um, style of presentations, reaching out to tech centers. Um, several of our grantee members, not several, but a few of our grantee members are using this exact flow and this exact walkthrough to um, reach out to mainly tech schools and things like that. But um, they've seen a, a massive improvement just, just by dedicating a little time, you know, uh, 30 minutes to an hour presentation and um, being able to hire four or five within a year, just right away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So um, do you feel that any of these folks that you've been working with, 
How competitive is it for them to try to find workers right now? In North Dakota, we have, we're about a 2% unemployment rate. Um, so it's super competitive. You know, just sitting at the stoplight the other day, there was this digital billboard and it was, come work for Highway Patrol up to 81000 come work at whatever company, $5,000 signing on bonus. And I was like, oh my, we just can't compete with that. <laughs> it's so competitive. It is, it's really competitive. And it's it's not something that is limited to where you find yourself in, in North Dakota. Um, I think, you know, to reference what Allison said earlier, and I think Brent mentioned it as well, This it takes time to develop talent pipelines. And it is an investment that you need to start making, you know, now before you need to hire and it can take, you know, six months to a year before you see any kind of return on investment. But I think there are a lot of examples of things that do work really well. Um, and when you, you know, I also, when you look at those kinds of signs, like you're looking for the right person, that's the right fit for you. It's it's not necessarily that you're competing with all of these other different opportunities and people make choices for where they end up based on a lot of different factors. So um, depending on where you are, you know, if you're a very rural area and there's housing challenges, attracting somebody to come and work with you might be better packaged with some kind of like housing allowance or access to, you know, housing supports. Um, if you're, you know, so there's there's different things that work better in different areas. I do think the youth audience is pretty critically important to growing the workforce. And I would say we need to be in middle schools now if we want to be moving the needle in, you know, three to five years when those kids are making choices about where they want to go. Um, so I, I would say, you know, not necessarily just high school presentations, but connecting with organizations in your area that are working with youth in, in different capacities. Um, yeah. And just to reiterate that, like, you need to cast a, you need to cast a wide net and that if you, if you do three presentations and get one job, something out of it, like, you didn't do it wrong, right? Like that you, again, you're looking, as Pagan said, you're looking to connect with the person that wants to be, right? We're all in this world, not for the paycheck, although that's part of it, right? But we're all in this weatherization world because we care about it. And there are those people out there who just have never heard about it, right? And so, um, you know, get, getting it out in front of as many people as possible is just always going to be helpful. And success is any is anything that you see, right? Success is also just people know what weatherization is. Maybe they go home and they talk to their parents and their parents are like, oh my God, we could use weatherization services. And that's what comes out of it, right? Understanding that anything that gets the word out is valuable. And I think Pagan and her whole team at IREC, you know, their, their presentation that they're doing in late January, they've put so much work into how to communicate about weatherization effectively to the network uh, or to the, to the, to broader audiences. And I think there's a lot of value that's going to be available on that Green Work Workforce Connect webpage coming up to help you, you know, uh, help make a better pitch <laughs> that will connect to people and make sense to them. We have just a couple minutes. Any last questions? And I think it was put in the chat, but we will uh, in the next probably the week next week as we get this this recording posted online, I'll send out the slides and the recording that you're welcome to share with anyone. We can still stay on for a couple minutes for last questions, but I wanted to just put the email addresses of all of us who were speakers here today. So you can follow up with any of us if you have questions or, you know, Kai mentioned he knows of some state agencies who are doing things I've referenced. I don't want to like out everybody and have everybody email like a certain person at a certain agency all at once. But if you really want to connect with someone, just just send us an email and we're happy to do some of that one-on-one -on -one connection. That's what this this technical assistance is really trying to do. Okay.
we'll hang on for just the next minute. But thank you all so much for making the time to be here. Oh, the last thing I will say, um, if any of you um, really appreciated today's presentation, for, especially if you're at like a state agency and you work with subgrantees across your service territory, um, something I think we can all talk about, but like if you thought not just sending this webinar link to all of your subgrantees, but if you thought it might be useful to offer like a version of it, you know, tailored to them. I think we we can talk about about doing something like that in the new year. We're all busy, but um, I just want to make sure that this information is is reaching people in a helpful way. So yeah, um, I just want to put that out there that at least I'm willing to have that conversation <laughs> with anyone on the phone. If you want another version of this that's not just the recording, um, we can try to talk about that as well. All right. Well, it is the top of the hour. Thank you all so much. I hope you have a great rest of your week and rest of your year. Um, and and we look forward to hearing more from you and, and seeing you again in these upcoming webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.